Uh, maybe I'll speak on the experience of Bahrain when it comes to, to gender uh, parity and, and women empowerment. It's definitely a story that we're very proud of. I know um, you mentioned some of the statistics, and I think we started on, on a, maybe a negative um, note, and that's maybe so how some people see it when they look into the future and they look on the, on the progress that has been done. And we're talking about hundreds of years to, to get there. We don't look at it the same way in Bahrain. I think we're, we're proud and privileged to have had the experience that we've had over the past year, uh, over the past years actually, and decades. So actually just earlier this year, um, His Majesty the King instructed um, the government headed by His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince and Prime Minister to start thinking about Vision 2050 for, uh, for Bahrain. So we've had Vision 2030 that was launched back in 2008, and now we're thinking about the Vision 2050. And so to do that, we, we took a look back. So we're looking at the past two decades um, and, and also since the, the launch of the Vision 2030. And of course, there's lots of numbers, but definitely there was one number that was quite striking, and it's the increase in female participation in the labor market. And that percentage since 2003 till 2023 is 126%. Um, so when you look at that number, it strikes you, but then you think, actually, it should not be surprising because when I look at the labor market at the moment in Bahrain, so of the total labor market, female participation is about 40%. It varies from private sector to public sector. It's actually more than 50% in the public sector, about 36% in the private sector. And then when you dig deep on various sectors, it also varies. So we have uh, about almost 40% in financial services sector. Um, Similar story when you look at uh, commercial registrations. So 42% of commercial registrations are held by women. About 40% of the SMEs are held and, and led by women. So it's actually quite a positive story. And when you think, again, we should not be surprised because when, when we look back, so Bahrain is, is a country of firsts when it came to, to women empowerment. We've had um, the first formal education introduced back in 1928. I believe it was the first country that even allowed um, 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 voting with um, municipalities, even before many of the European countries. So the way we see it is, is um, there has been great progress. I would say yes, uh, COVID maybe slowed things down like it slowed many of the things, but also there were a lot of initiatives and programs that were introduced to make sure that women are not economic victim, victims of, of COVID. And I can speak of, of uh, a few of those later. But I think it's more, the way we see it is more of a positive story. I think we're on the right trajectory when it comes to, to women um, participation and, and uh, gender parity. Let's talk about how can the government and the private sector work together. Yeah. You are a, a minister here. Yeah. So uh, how can the collaboration accelerate the gender equality? And then... Uh, has there been any legislation in, in Bahrain to that e effect? Uh, are you collaborating with the private sector? To, so if you can shed some light in, for us to, to learn from. Absolutely. I think you cannot actually tackle this or any other issue without the collaboration of the private and the public sector. So the, the answer to that is, is absolutely. Actually, we rely on the private sector. I think Hanadi mentioned that is, is, is the importance of, of really um, collaborating and ensuring that a big segment of society, be the private sector, is actually on board when it comes to, to um, women empowerment. Um, so um, I think it's two parts to the question. First is, is, is legislation, and I'll add to that policy as well. And the second part is, is, is the partnership with the private sector. Um, and again, if we look at the policy and, and legislation, and, and Lur here mentioned about the, the gender parity, it's actually, a couple of years ago, Bahrain made it a law, or actually amended the law to ensure that there is no discrimination whatsoever when it comes to pay between the women and men um, of, a, of a work of equal value. So that's now actually in the law. And so there's no discrimination um, whatsoever. And also, um, the interesting part of it is removing also restrictions when it comes to women working part-time, especially at night. So that also got, uh, got removed um, from the law. Not that it really prohibited, I think, women from working, but it, it definitely needed to be reflected in the law itself um, to ensure that, that, that it really reflects the reality. So that's maybe in terms of the legislation. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to um, the point about COVID and the slowdown um, that's, that's happened and ensuring that women were not victims during COVID. Women made up actually in Bahrain about 75% um, 
of the task force that dealt with COVID. They were the majority of the people on the front line from people doing the, the testing and the nurses. It was majority women. And so the Supreme Council for, for uh, Women, headed by uh, Her Royal Highness, the, the wife of, of His Majesty the King, ensured that there were a series of policies and, and, and um, directives that were issued to, to protect women during that period. And so women were allowed, or mothers were allowed to work from home, but also fathers of women on the front line were allowed to work from home. So that's also to give the men a chance of um, uh, supporting the women in, in the work that they do. Um, in addition to that, they launched a campaign to support women when it comes to mental health and, and mental support. And also Her, Her Royal Highness extended a loan and a debt waiver to women who were struggling financially uh, to pay their outstanding debt, especially those divorced, widowed, or suffering from chron chronic di diseases. So it's policies that, that are reactive um, and that come on time when, in, 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 in times, I guess, of difficulties that really make, make a difference. Um, on the partnership, actually, there's quite a few examples when it comes to the partnership between the private and the public sector um, that we can touch on. And we definitely recognize the, the importance of that. Um, maybe one example that I can, I can cover is, is the Supreme Council Women in Tech Incubation Program that was launched by the Central Bank of Bahrain in partnership with, with um, the Standard Chartered Bahrain, Tamkeen, and Bahrain Fintech Bay. So it's quite a lot of the, of the players in the ecosystem in Bahrain that came together to, to launch that program. That's one of many, actually. What we're seeing is, is amazing in terms of, of the recognition by the private sector of the importance of women. And just the that point, and, and something that, that people used to say before, which is so true, you cannot isolate half of the society. It's almost easy maths. You add more input, you get more output. So it actually makes sense, I think, on all fronts to have more women. Just a, a quick point, just a friend. Um, I mean, we talk about the right speed, but I don't know if there is a right speed. Um, it really depends on um, the country, the, the company itself. I think we all agree. I definitely agree having more women in a workplace makes it better. Mm. We see it, and I hope the men see it. Mm. But, I, and, and, but that's, that, that's become a fact of life. But setting a quota and forcing it, I'm not sure that's the right way, because then you get the questions of, oh, you only made it because mm. the, of the quota. And we don't want that hanging above our heads. Mm. It's we've only made it because of that. And we, we talk about um, men should be part of it. In some places, they are. Because for us, we saw the change in Bahrain two years ago. For, for the longest time ever, we only had one female minister. Now we have five. Um, and I am the first ever chief executive of the Economic Development Board, 20 years into it. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that part of that change we're seeing right now, is there more to be done? Absolutely more to be done. Um, talking about also like um, the, 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 the mom role and, and the female role, I think um, the, I'm sure there are still examples where people get asked when they've just had a baby to just come back and do it. But also we've seen examples of, um, and, and I've seen it with, with some of our teams, that we've accelerated mm. some of the promotions for the females that got married and started having kids because we knew the slowdown would come later. But it was also because based on their, um, their, their ability. And I've seen it with my own. I think we're setting an example here for women and men, show an example of how a female that has kids is able to take them in the morning to school, do their homework, go to work, do the nine to five and the nine to eight and the nine to 10, and have a balanced yes, work-life yes. balance. So I think we are showing that example, and that's something that I pride in myself in, in, in doing it. Not always perfect, but I definitely think we, that Bahrain has provided few examples for people in recent years. So. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm George Salem from Washington, D.C. Uh, I was solicitor of labor, a chief labor policy person in the 1980s in the Reagan and Bush administrations. We grappled with this issue <clears throat> and we forbade quotas, but we allowed affirmative action. Not only did we allow affirmative action, mm. we insisted upon it if you were doing business with the United States government. Mm. Therefore, all of the major corporations had to do something they were unaccustomed to doing, which is include women and minorities in the senior ranks and they had to have an affirmative action plan, which was monitored by an Office of Federal Compliance at the Department of Labor. Yep. And that culture 40 years ago has now uh, filtered down to where uh, I think we have as close to parity as just about any other nation on the planet. Uh, 
Thank my you. question to you is, do you have, uh, have you gr uh, thought about affirmative action as a policy of the governments that you represent? Thank you. Okay. Do you want to? Uh... Absolutely. I think just to that point before, before I forget, um, I think we've talked about uh, mm. the quotas. Um, yeah. I, I actually don't mind the incentive side of it yes. and to give um, a period of time for people to adjust. The point that I think it was mentioned already on the panel is, in the meantime, can we focus on getting women ready for the board? And then we can set a quota later. And that's, I think, what we'd like to see is, is more focus on the education, on the training, what it means. So I think that would be um, what, what I would be pushing for. Later on, we can, have, we can have the quota and add an incentive to it. I think that will encourage people to, to participate. The point about mental health, again, I'd love to, to hear what the research is saying, but definitely I think more attention is being given not only to women when it comes to mental health, it's men and women that support and kids and really all genders and all ages. So I think there is a definitely a recognition more now of what it means and its impact. Yeah. A couple of things also, and I like what the gentleman said, and actually I was going to end with that, it's, it's education, just give the women education and um, give them access to, or to be able to set up their own businesses and whether that's through initiatives or programs, providing financing, supporting their innovation. So I think it's, it's those two for independence as well. So. Right, just to keep it short. Uh, time to end up. I have to say it's been a great to be with these great panelists. Thank you. Uh, the energy in the room is amazing.